Hello. Hi, Hi everyone. Thank you for joining me here uh, online in these uh, unprecedented times. I know it's a cliche, it's been rinsed to meaninglessness in our mouths, but I suppose even as a poet, to be able to lean on these, these phrases and these, um, these, these morsels of language that we've collectively created to try and make some sense of the world we're living in now, I, I cling on to those in lieu of any attempt to try and be clever or original. Um, even though these times aren't unprecedented really, um, you know, society has been here before, maybe not in living memory, but um, yeah, everything feels new when you yourself are experiencing it for the first time. But all of this is to say that I know that there's a lot of confusion, fear, apathy, um, and other such emotions. So the fact that you would still tune in um, and listen to some poems um, is, a, is, is an honor. And I'm really glad that you're here. So this is my friend Ollie, um, and uh, I, I wanted him to join me for this first poem. And I know that we've just made some really earnest and serious comments about um, poetry's impact and its political gravitas. Uh, but I wanna do a poem about an octopus. And I, so I'm going to do what I want. <laughs> if there's one thing that a pandemic makes you realize is that, um, you know, death, death, death comes swift and she and she won't give you um, due notice. So you've just got to do what you want in this life as much as as much as possible. So when I feel like doing a poem about octopuses, I will. Um, so Ollie's going to sit on my shoulder while I do this. Um, and I hope you enjoy it. Uh, they have quickly become my favorite animal uh, for reasons that will hopefully be apparent as I read this piece. Um, are you gonna stay there? Yeah, you're not gonna get up to any nonsense while I'm reading my poem, do you promise? Okay, you're all thinking what is going on? <laughs> I'm logging off right now. You're stuck here, all right? <laughs> you and me together, we're doing this. Here's a poem about octopuses. Octopus, there, and there again, lacerations of limb, angsty and anxious, like thoughts missing their anchors. Octopus, unwitting victim of bad PR, unwilling star of monster myth and niche Japanese porn. Octopus, you move how a child moves, how a Harlem jazz band jams, how cigarette smoke blooms, how loneliness meanders, nomadic able to squeeze into the tiniest of spaces. Octopus, fuck, you are just the coolest. Octopus, proto-punk whip muscle, hench quasi jellyfish, cautionary tale, misunderstood, solitary, unsung alien emo of the ocean. Octopus, tentacles lace behind my ankles. I am pulled forward with a soft smack. The ocean licks its salt-rimmed lips. Did I mention I am not the most confident of swimmers? Did you press your fingers to my neck in search of a pulse or gills? Octopus, you terrify me. Octopus, I see myself in you. Octopus, I'd like to strike up a friendship with you. We'd watch back-to-back -back episodes of Planet Earth, which is kind of like the aquatic world's Instagram. Pornographic spikes of light rippling the blue into gray, then green and back again. Schools of fish glinting like sweet wrappers. Coral reefs winking. Starfish splayed out like acquiescent assholes on a background of gorgeous turquoise. My new pal will turn and look at me as if to say, what a beautiful home I have. I barely recognized it. Octopus. The plural is actually octopuses, not octopi. The valve of the last syllable spits and hisses, never quite finishes, will not give in to crisp diction. It demands you sit patient with its aftertaste. Octopus. They change color. Less like chameleons and more like mood rings. As they perish, they turn white as a gasp. You did really, really well there. You did, you barely even fidgeted. I'm super proud of you, but I'm gonna get you off my shoulder now because I've got cramp, okay? You just pop yourself over there. 
amazing. What a duo. Um, that's an octopus poem. Uh, I suppose if I want to justify why I might read that at an event about the impact of poetry, I do think that what we are missing is poetry that, that speaks about nature uh, with a sense of of playfulness and accessibility that nature poetry often doesn't. I think a lot of people feel quite disconnected from nature poetry, particularly in its classical um, iterations. Um, long dead white men who wrote about the hills and the daffodils and the clouds and, and whatnot and wrote about it beautifully too. But you know, where are the, the young people, the people of color, um, the people who live in urban environments, you know, where's, where's their voice? Um, in the conversations, not just about nature, but about the climate crisis. And I think that's what the type of changes that we need are, is going to hinge on. Um, that conversation widening out beyond the same old faces, the same old voices, the academics, you know, the men, uh, the white people, you know. Um, and it's exciting to see that we're starting to see uh, climate crisis through the perspective of, you know, indigenous cultures um, or, or young people or you know, people that oftentimes aren't given the uh, assumption of intelligence or insight to be able to understand um, and appreciate uh, nature or the urgency with which we need to address its degeneration. So that would be my, my attempt to weave in the political urgency to a poem about the fact that I think octopuses are sick. Um, so there we go. That was a smooth segue, I'm proud of that. Um, so this next poem, was mentioned in the introduction, a piece that came along in a way that very few poems do. Oftentimes it's a, it's a real process of constant editing and, and overthinking and changing commas and, and, and cutting lines and a lot of self-doubt um, and, 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 and overwrought thinking to, to, to make a poem. But every now and then, the muses, the moment, uh, all these different things come together to make something happen in a really organic and beautiful way. And that's what happened when the statue of Edward Colston came down in Bristol. Uh, I wasn't actually present at the protest, but I saw the videos and the next day wrote this piece, posted it and then mild, chaos in suit. well chaos is perhaps not the word but you know just this this overwhelming sense of everybody when you when you go viral uh, I, I I'm loath to use that term in reference to myself but I suppose it's it's accurate hundreds of thousands of people watch that video it feels like a hundred thousand people are in your living room talking at you <laughs> it's it's a very overwhelming experience um but yeah this poem I suppose it's a culmination of, of, of feelings I've always had about the legacy of colonialism and the way that came together with the moment and, and this very poetic image of the statue coming down the way it did is just, it's, it's, a, it's, a, it's a rather beautiful thing. So this is called Hollow. You came down easy in the end, that righteous wrench of two ropes in a grand plie and briefly you flew corkscrewed, then met the ground with the clang of toy guns, loose change, chains, a rain of cheers, standing ovation on the platform of your neck. Punk ballet, act one, there is more to come. And who carved you? They took such care on that stately pose and propped chin. Wise and virtuous, the plaque assured us. Victors wish history static and odorless, but history's a sneaky mistress, moves like smoke, Colston, like saliva in a hungry mouth. This is your rightful home, here in the pit of chaos with the rest of us. Take your twisted glory and feed it to the tadpoles. Kids will write raps to that syncopated splash. I think of you lying in the harbor with the horrors you hosted. There is no poem more succinct than that, but still, you are permanent. You who perfected the ratio, blood to sugar, to money, to bricks. Each bougie building we flaunt, haunted by bones. Children learn and titans sing under the stubborn rust of your name, but the air is gently throbbing with newness. Can you feel it? 
Colston. I can't get the sound of you from my head. Countless times I pass that plinth, its heavy threat of metal and marble. But as you landed, a piece of you broke off, fell away, and inside, nothing but air. So that whole time, you were hollow. Thank you. I've been rabbiting away in between these poems. So I don't think I'll get through all the pieces I want to do, but hopefully the hosts will let me know when I'm almost out of time. But um, I'd love to share um, a piece that is not mine. Um, it's by a poet called Liesel Müller, um, German poet who is uh, no longer with us, uh, but wrote the most stunning poems. And uh, poetry has been a real solace for me, not just as a writer, but as a reader. Um, and those, those two things very much go hand in hand for me. Um, I'm a writer because I'm a reader and vice versa. So it's been really wonderful to, to dig into poetry collections and let them speak to the moment in the way that only poetry can. Um, and this is a poem that um, has given me a lot of comfort. And it's called The Blind Leading the Blind. Take my hand. There are two of us in this cave. The sound you hear is water. You will hear it forever. The ground you walk on is rock. I have been here before. People come here to be born, to discover, to kiss, to dream and to dig and to kill. Watch for the mud. Summer blows in with the scent of horses and roses, fall with the sound of sound breaking. Winter shoves its empty sleeve down the dark of your throat. You will learn toads from diamonds, the fist from the palm, love from the sweat of love, falling from flying. There are a thousand turnoffs. I have been here before. Once I fell off a precipice, once I found gold, once I stumbled on murder, the thin parts of a girl. Walk on, keep walking. There are axes above us. Watch for occasional bits and bubbles of light. Birthdays for you, recognitions, yourself, another. Watch for the mud. Listen for bells, for beggars. Something with wings went crazy against my chest once. There are two of us here. Touch me. So that's Liesl Mueller. Um, this is from a collection called um, Alive Together which I heartily recommend. Um, so next up, uh, I wanna share a poem that I wrote quite recently, uh, which is called Reasons to Fight. Cause poets don't know shit with our subtleties and soft ass palms. Cause your anger is scatty and homeless, must find a place for the toaster, the bread knife, the moose head it killed and skinned with its own hands because you're bored and restless with a mouth of jobless teeth, because you like to be the father of a crunching sound inside someone's skull, because you want to be inside someone's skull, because girls aren't supposed to, because tats and clip piercings are a thing, because we're just animals with novelty sweatshirts on, because you've never broken a bone and they only write songs about broken things, because umbilical cords are rich with blood, because we were born into soupy pools of it, because Angelina Jolie put hers in a vial and strung it round her lover's neck, and she won FHM's Hottest Woman three years in a row. Okay, so I don't know how I'm doing for time. I'm just going to check if they're saying in the chat. I've got one minute. <laughs> um, okay. One minute is not very long. Um, unless they sent that two minutes ago and I'm actually out of time. Oh, that you says can, 10 minutes. That says 10 minutes. On. Yeah. Okay. Um, um, okay, I'll do, so do I have 10 minutes? I'm confused now. Carry on for how long? <laughs> oh, let's see here, 10 minutes. Okay, cool. We're on track. Um, okay, yeah, I've got, I've got a couple more poems. So let me do, let me do another cover. Um, this is another, absolutely sublime poet. This one's not dead. 
uh, Terence Hayes. And this collection is called American Sonnets for My Past and Future Assassin. One of those collections that just makes you furious because it's just so accomplished in an annoying way, in an unnecessary way. Uh, calm down, innit? Like, let the rest of us, you know, give us a chance. Um, but no, Terence Hayes doesn't work like that. He just, he, he gifts the world with his brilliance and then he, he walks off into the sunset. Fair play. Um, and this is a poem from that collection that I absolutely adore and return to um, many, many times because it just reveals another layer every, every time I read it. As you're also a reader, you told us. Oh, sorry, these, these, these are questions for later. Um, I'll leave the chat box alone, but thank you for answering, asking questions. Um, we'll be coming to those in a moment. So, seven of the 10 things I love in the face of James Baldwin concern the spiritual elasticity of his expressions. The sachet between left and right eyebrow, for example. The crease between his eyes like a tuning fork or furrow, like a riverbed branching into tributaries like lines of rapturous sentences searching for a period. The dimple in his chin narrows and expands like a pupil. Most of all, I love all of his eyes. And those wrinkles, the feel and colour of wet driftwood in the mud around those eyes. Mud is made of simple rain and earth, the same baptismal spills and hills of dirt James Baldwin is made of. So yeah, that's a beautiful thing for one of the best writers of our generation to be uh, paying homage to one of the best writers of the previous one and one of the best writers of all time, who is of course James Baldwin, um, who wrote essays and, and novels uh, and many, many other things, perhaps even plays. I'm not sure whether he was a poet. Um, I, must, I must do my research on that. So this last piece is also a nod to uh, my, my, write, my writerly ancestors, uh, the people for whom I write in many ways, because the, I, I, I feel like particularly as, as black artists, uh, we really rely on the precedence of people that came before us to, to be reflections of, of who we are, to have spoken to certain aspects of our experience, to know that that could even be um, preserved or respected within literature at all. Um, you know, I think I speak for many black women when I say that when you are a book lover and you, you have an education, in this country and actually <laughs> if you go to any colonial uh, pre-colonial country country that used to be a colony of the uk um a lot of what they teach as literature is the literature of britain so you know you're learning about shakespeare you're learning about wordsworth you're learning about um jane austen and you're reading stories that concern white people and so you you take for granted that stories are about white people um and the first time I ever read a book that had black people at its center, it was uh, The Color Purple by Alice Walker, which I'm sure you're familiar with. And there's another amazing black writer called Zora Neale Hurston, who uh, was alive during the Harlem Renaissance. And uh, we now consider her a very important figure. You know, her book, the, uh, Her Eyes Were Watching God is considered you know, a very classic and important text, but she actually died in poverty um, her books had come out of print. She, she was a cleaner in her last years. Um, if it weren't for Alice Walker uh, seeking out her grave, which was unmarked and, and working hard to make sure her books came out of obscurity and back into the public canon, uh, we would have lost her work for good. So I think it's a really beautiful illustration of how black people often have to fight hard um, to, to not only have the opportunity to write our experiences or write the stories that concern us, um, but to make sure that history will hold on to them and that posterity will take care of um, our legacies. Um, because oftentimes the people that decide what is canonical and what is important are happy to put our stories aside and, and let them basically perish. So it's our responsibility as black writers to make sure that we are preserving our stories and, and, and pulling from the past and also um, investing in our future writers, the young people coming up. Um, so anyway, this is a poem called Alice and Zora, which is a rubbish title. I've never thought of a better one. So that's just been the working one for the many years that I've been performing this piece, but it goes like this. 
a nondescript day, cold and brisk as the epitaph no one thought to search for. A gravestone minds its business with the same grace as abandoned books and slow healing wounds. But here, in a moment hushed and pulsing, she's coming. Alice, remember, you were 14 years into flounder and she found you, pulled all that sad from you like a damp rope of lavender. That book beckoned you to a place sick stinking of burnt dinners, unfinished thoughts, the mortal pauses between laughter, grimace, kiss of teeth. There were women squatting between pages, purple with gossip and gospel, the prophecies only cleaning ladies and wet nurses know. It's a necessary sin to disturb the dead, play sharp hooks in their turgid throats and tug. Here they cling, the legacies that only made it halfway up the throat. We know this, us who are forced to thieve our own stillborn history. At the notion that this soil doesn't know us, we smile and offer up the exhibit of our fingernails, brown as the mothers that bore us. We take damn good care of our ghosts, nursing them like newborns. Thank you very much. I'm going to leave it there and uh, let's crack on with some questions and hopefully I'll have some answers. I'm pretty comfortable with being transparent when I don't know things. So if you ask me some super clever questions to which I do not have any answers, I'm going to be very honest about that. <laughs> so let's see what you've got for me. Right, thank you so much, Vanessa. That was an amazing reading. Um, yeah, I really, really enjoyed it. Um, and I, I love the way your, your poetry is, is so full of joy and, and humor and, and the sense of wonder. You know, I, the one about the octopus was absolutely <laughs> lovely. Yeah. Did you, did you um, hear that? She liked, she liked our one the best. I like the octopus, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, before, before we look at the um, questions coming in, I, I have a couple of my own. Um, and, and one of the things um, I was thinking about is that it's such a great time for poetry. Um, because I think poetry like blossoms in times of crisis. Um, and you see the kind of attention um, that you got with your poem Hollow or the, or the, what's been happening with Amanda Gorman um, who has gone, you know, so viral that, you know, she's suddenly a supermodel and at the Super Bowl and all that kind of stuff. Um, so what do you think about, do you, do you agree that the crisis is, is the right time for poetry to kind of really uh, stand out and, and do something? Yes and no. I think, it's beautiful that poetry could rise to the occasion when it comes to big political moments of, of, of upheaval or even transcendence, um, that it can be emblematic of a particular uh, period in time, um, of a collective sense of, of, of who we are or what we're striving towards. But I also think that that's why poetry often still lingers in the periphery of people's minds as far as a form of art that they would go to on any day. You know, I think poetry should also be, people should approach it with the same casualness they would watching a film on Netflix or, um, you know, reading a novel on holiday or, you know, all these other forms of art that we feel very comfortable to, to go to and normalize music, you know, music being this, this soundtrack to life for a lot of people, but poetry is the thing that we bring out for weddings and funerals and inaugurations and <laughs> moments of, of huge political um, uh, shift. Mm. And whilst that is a, a wonderful thing uh, and it speaks to the fact that poetry can, it, can express things that perhaps other art forms cannot in those moments, uh, it, the fact still remains that poetry for a lot of people is still a very daunting and elitist art form. It's something they remember from school, something they remember having to study rather than enjoy or study before they could enjoy it. And that for me is where I think the real work is, is to make poetry part of our everyday, part of our, part of our bread, our daily bread, you know, it shouldn't mm -hmm. have to be um, something that feels more like a banquet, you know, or a three course meal. Cause for me, poetry is something that I, I nibble at every day. It's not, it's not a big deal for me. So it's, it's wonderful to see people responding to Amanda Gorman the way they do or, or the, or my poem the way they did. Um, but my whole thing is like, don't now run away and don't read another poem again for five years, <laughs> you know, like yeah. come in, yeah. like get comfy. There's, there's, there's poetry for every occasion, every moment, every feeling. Um, so yeah, I think it's 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 one part of the equation, but there's other things that I would love to see poetry slot into. 
Mm. A poem like Hollow does really like mark an occasion in, and it becomes iconic in the same way that, that the images of that event, I think it, it kind of adds something that goes beyond the image. So perhaps, yeah. Um, Ines had a question about um, that and I wondered whether she wanted to ask it live. It didn't say the way she was going to, but Ines, your question about Hollow. Is she coming in? If she's not coming in, I'll ask it. Um, and she says, can you explain why in particular Hollow went viral um, and what happened after it? Did it change your life? Uh, I can't explain why <laughs> Hollow went viral. I don't think anybody who's ever had something they have made catch the zeitgeist in that way. I don't think that's something you can ever anticipate or explain. It's an alchemy of time, luck, and you know, the, the, the feeling in the air at a particular moment in time, you know, a lot of people were talking about that statue felling in various ways. I use the medium that makes most sense to me, which is poems. Um, mm. So, you know, I don't think it's necessarily about the poem itself. I think it was about the fact that there was a lot of attention on that moment. And uh, it spoke to it in a novel way. You know, it wasn't a, a, a Twitter thread. It wasn't an article. Um, it was, it was something else. It spoke to the the more knotty emotional um, aspects of it, more so than the political commentary. Um, so, so who's to say? And it's not my, it's not my job to to try and pick apart why that came about the way it did. Um, did it change my life? Um, not really. I mean, in in small ways, yeah. You know, there's you get more twi followers on Twitter. You get you know a, a few more bits of work in, or a few more people who have you on their radar. But day to day, I still live where I've always lived. Um, uh, I still eat the same meals. I haven't become a millionaire. Um, <laughs> I still write the way I've been writing, you know. So, you know, very much business as usual. Um, and that's not to undermine. I'm so happy and glad that people responded to that poem the way they did, particularly um, so many teachers taking it on and using it in schools and, and hearing that kids really respond to it and find it exciting and, um, and, and really sparks their interest in, in poetry and also, you know, political conversation. That for me is the most, the best thing to come from it, you know? Um, mm. But, you know, I don't want to get ahead of myself, you know, like the internet is built off of these moments of virility and then people move on, you know? So I'm not under any illusion about the fact that I'm some sort of oracle now. <laughs> I know I wasn't before and I'm not now. So that's what I'd say about that. You, you just mentioned that um, it was picked up in schools, um, and I, I know you've you've done some some work with schools yourself, um, and I wondered whether you could tell us about that. I, I think it's so important that children come in contact with poetry uh, as young as possible, really. Yeah, I couldn't agree more, and I think uh, every country is different. Um, I don't know what it's like uh, in the Scandinavian countries. I mean, let's be honest, probably better because you do everything better, but. <sighs> in this country, particularly under conservative government, um, the way literature is being taught to young people just is going to strip any passion or uh, care for the love of language out of any kid who isn't absolutely built and, and gunning for that, regardless of how it's being taught to them. There's always gonna be the kids that respond super well to, to books, literature, um, and you know that's always gonna be the way for them. But we lose so many children who could be ignited by language through whichever medium, whether it be poetry, novels, plays, um, you know, let's, let's be more elastic with how we perceive these things. You know, there's so many amazing things going on on YouTube or Twitter or whatever with language that could definitely fall under the umbrella of, 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 of poetry or of oratory or whatever you want to call it. But the way things are taught, there's such an obsession with, you know, classical texts and, and annotation and analysis and, to be honest, those things, those academic approaches to language can only be a joy once you have approached it with the personal. Like, what do I like about this poem? Do I like the way it sounds as I read it? Um, what does it make me think of? How does it make me think about how it relates to my life? And, you know, teachers are so squeezed and stressed um, in this country. You know, they're not being paid enough. Um, they're being given all these quotas they have to fulfill. So even teachers that want to approach these things with more creativity and, and, and give kids a chance to respond in their own way, they, they don't have the time or the wherewithal or the resources a lot of the time. So mm -hmm. what you're finding is that kids, you know, you go in and you try to teach your poetry workshop and they go, poetry, like, ugh. And who's to blame them? Because they've been taught that, 
poetry is about underlining where the rhyme is or where the assonance is or, um, you know, memorizing when it was written and, and what historical mo moments were happening at the time and all this, all this dry shit that your average kid isn't going to care about, let's be honest, um, unless they've been given an emotional hook. Then from there, it's interesting when it was written. It's interesting why they use this literary device, but we just, we teach everything the wrong way around. And a lot of teachers are intimidated by poetry themselves because they weren't taught it very well. So, you know, it's this constant cycle of, of fear and aversion that is impossible to reverse until you, until you basically just pull away all the academic stuff and say, first of all, let's just get people excited about this thing. Until mm. you get them excited, you cannot force them to sit down and enjoy analyzing every single aspect of why this poem was written the way it was. So it's a real uphill struggle to go into a school and try and convince a bunch of kids that poetry is exciting because of all the stuff that's happening in the, the classrooms. But the minute you get them talking about the world and what they care about um, and the music they listen to and, and all these things that already inspire them and then you get them to put that through the funnel of poetry and how that relates, they get it and they love it because who wouldn't? So, you know, being able to create that connection is a privilege, but I'm only ever there often for, let's say, maximum a day. You know, this needs to be a part of the curriculum. It needs to be something that is instilled in kids for, you know, all those years that they're in school. Um, so, you know, unless I become governor for education, there's not a lot I can do about that. But I do, I do my <laughs> tiny, I do my tiny little bit. No, I definitely don't have it in me to be, be a politician, dear God. Mm -hmm. yeah. Absolutely not. <laughs> Uh, okay, let's have a look in the in the Q and A. I think there was just um, there was just one more um, if I can find it a question from Peter Neiser, who is actually an old colleague of mine. Um, he said, "As you're also a reader, you told us what have you been reading recently that really overwhelmed you?" Okay, I've read a lot of brilliant things recently. I've been I've had a round of luck. You know, sometimes you know, you pick up certain books because you've heard they're good or whatever, and you know, some are good and some are not, but like I've had a streak of just banging books <laughs> for the past mm. few months. And um, there's a great book called Some Kids I Taught and What They Taught Me, which fits I in very neatly yeah. with, yeah, with what we've just been talking about by um, yeah. a, a, an amazing writer and teacher called Kate Clanchy, um, which I would recommend to anyone who thinks about teaching, education, creativity, you know, how we could start to instill those things in children in a meaningful way. She just, she knows what she's talking about. And on top of that, she's just the most stunning writer. Um, that was a, in a particularly moving book for me. Um, I've also loved um, a poetry collection called Poor by Caleb Femi, um, which has been released by Penguin recently. Um, it's about um, you know, being a young black boy growing up on an estate. Um, a lot of the assumptions and uh, projections that are placed on those types of children um, how their their architectural environment affects the way they see themselves, the way they conduct themselves. Um, and I think, you know, in, in light of things that have happened in recent history, like Grenfell um, and, you know, the constant demonization of young black boys, um, even the way we perceive um, particular aspects of culture that come from young black men, whether it be grind music or drill, um, there's, there's, there's so much in there that, that, that mines these topics in a really beautiful, um, interesting and often humorous way. You know, I think we're, we're so used to that type of life being depicted as this really dark, you know, sort of a uh, urban cautionary tale, but there's also these moments of, of beauty and levity. Um, and that for me is one of the best approach collections I've ever read. Um, mm. So I definitely recommend that to anyone. Um, and one more thing I'll say, um, I'm reading a book right now called Such a Fun Age. Um, called by Kylie Reed that is just, I, you know, books that you're just like, ah, get it in my face. Um, so every spare minute I'm, I'm reading that. It's just so brilliant. So yeah, um, those are those are three things. I could go on more, but let me leave it there. <laughs> yeah, you've, you've given us a load of material to go and look up afterwards and, and some great poets and, and writers. So that, that's, that's ah, sorry, my cat just jumped off my lap and tore out my earphones. Um, <laughs> One, one last thing before we um, start rounding up. Um, each night, the previous poet passes on a question to the following night's performer. Oh, okay. Um, and, and last night, uh, Rodan Al-Galidi -Galid uh, formulated the following question for you, Vanessa. 
And it, it's not so much a question as a kind of really difficult mission, I'm afraid. He said, um, Vanessa, you are English, so your words will reach a lot of people. Um, can you make a book like the Bible, the, Quor the Quran, or the Torah, filled with emotions, beauty, and love? Um, not for commercial reasons, <laughs> and I will help you if you like. I mean, that's a big ask. Isn't it? Yeah. That's a, I mean, it takes balls to ask that of another person, <laughs> so I'll give him that. Look, yeah. I'm not going to make any promises, but should I feel moved to such a, a massive task, I will do my absolute best. Let's yeah. say that. Let's yeah. say that. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And he, he's got a book out in England, actually. It's called um, Two Blankets, Three Sheets, about his time in a, um, as an asylum seeker in Holland. So mm. I can recommend that one to you. <laughs> yeah. yeah. And he's absolutely right about, um, you know, for obvious reasons, this uh, dominance of, of English, even just down to the science that then becomes a part of the, the general domain of knowledge. Um, I, I remember hearing somewhere that um, there's such a pressure to publish papers in English if you want your ideas to transmit widely. Um, mm. And then you think about how much knowledge is falling through the gaps because, you know, this paper that was written in Finnish, no one translated it into English. And then, you know, this, this idea isn't connecting with other ideas in, in the way that it might if it were in English. And I don't know what the solution is to that because English speakers are very arrogant and we, we never want to learn other people's languages. <laughs> yeah. um, because I don't, I don't think it's about everybody else having to bow to English. I think it's about English people getting over themselves and realizing that they are not, you know, the only people on this planet. Um, but yes, I, I, I take the privilege of being an English speaker very seriously. So mm. yeah, it's a good provocation. So, so we have to send a question through to uh, tomorrow's poet. So I'll just say who that is. So at the same time tomorrow, we'll have the programme in Dutch with Flemish poet Paul de Metz. He's mm -hmm. um, not a city poet, but a countryside poet. Uh -huh. And he writes about nature and the countryside um, and the climate crisis, that kind of thing. Um, mm. So I wonder whether we could uh, think of a question. Ooh, I wish thing. you'd asked me beforehand because I would have come up with something killer, but now you've put oh. me on the spot. <laughs> Um, oh, I, I wonder we, we could ask him about um, uh, what you said at the beginning about um, uh, nature poetry being so serious and um, how to liven it up. Perhaps, perhaps. Um, you know what? Okay, let's say, like, okay, should the world end um, in the next 20 years, you know, what would you leave? Okay, no, no, no. If uh, a certain aspect of your landscape that you treasure is going to disappear in 20 years, what would you leave in a capsule to show to your grandchildren? Or if not your specific, you know, um, uh, progeny, then, uh, you know, the, the children of the future who are not gonna be able to see this thing because it's gone for good. What is that one image that you would preserve for them to be able to see? Um, if if it were to be lost, that's not that's a very not that's not no, yeah it's, it's not, not very well phrased. But yeah. hopefully you can you can yeah. you can remix it so I'm it makes sure. sense. Yeah yeah yeah. That's this is lovely. A, this is the problem of lockdown. I've just completely lost the ability to make a coherent sentence. Uh, <laughs> so you'll have <laughs> to forgive anyone. me for that. Yeah yeah. yeah. <laughs> we've we've got one last question in actually from um, Jan Barker, who's who's the presenter of the the Dutch uh, poetry on impact. Mm -hmm. uh, programs and I, I wonder Jan if you just wanted to ask that live. Yes I can do if, if you like. <clears throat> um, you talked about the uh, well first of all let me say I was very impressed by your reading and, and the things you, you come up with and you talked in the beginning about the climate crisis as mm -hmm. an aspect we all deal with and I was I wondered because you're from from England and England has a strong tradition in writing about nature. Mm. Um, do you think that the concern about the climate crisis could could be merged into some new poetics that yes. bring the, the tradition of nature writing into a new 21st century style of poetics. Mm. And I think it's happening. I do think it's happening. I think it's often difficult to understand what something is when you're in it. I think perhaps in five or 10 years, we'll be able to look at nature writing now and be like, oh, this is very particular to the time we were in and the questions we were asking, um, but definitely 
you know, every now and then I hear poets um, defining as, you know, like eco-queer poets or poets exploring nature through this particular type of uh, poetic form or whatever, and it, and it always piques my interest. And, you know, you have uh, competitions and prizes that are specifically for poetry exploring nature, poetry exploring, you know, the, the, the climate crisis. So I think there is definitely money and time um, being put into uh, in spite, um, it, it inciting artists to, to, to speak into this. Um, and not just the people that you would expect, the, the, the white middle-class people that live up in, you know, the, the, the green leafy hills, you know, um, but also, you know, young people, um, people who live in urban areas who are actually far more likely to, um, to suffer from the effects of climate change because of where they live, right? Because <laughs> they're not surrounded by the trees that, um, you know, make their air cleaner to breathe and, and this and that and the other. So um, I'm definitely excited to see uh, a wider scope of voices speaking about nature in their own ways, you know, um, because, you know, the, the, the beautiful sonnets about chaffinches are lovely, but <laughs> we can have other things too. Great, thank you so much. Um, we're actually um, coming to the end of tonight's programme um, and I want to thank everyone uh, who came uh, to a webinar on their Saturday night. <laughs> I know, there's not, nowhere else you can go, but <laughs> still, thank you for coming. And, and Vanessa, you were really inspiring and, and your poetry has so much impact and I'm sure it will continue to do so on everyone. Thank you. To and uh, goodbye from me and goodbye from Ollie. Um, bye, Ollie. Don't be, why are you being all shy now? It's a bit late for all that. He says, he says bye. Okay. <laughs> yeah, thank you. Thank you very much, everyone, for, for listening. Really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you so much. We'll see you tomorrow night. Uh, Jan Barker will be talking to uh, Flemish poet Paul Demetz. Bye-bye. <laughs>